This is the Registered Behavior Technician course presented by Shaza Tar. The course content was created by Shaza Tar and is the property of Autism Therapy and Training, Inc. All rights are reserved. This training program is based on the Behavior Analyst Certification Board 2018 RBT Task List 2nd Edition and is designed to meet the 40-hour training requirement for the RBT credential. The program is offered independent of the BACB. Remember, in each class, we will have our active listening, a quiz, and a competency assessment. Hello everyone, welcome back to today's class. I'm excited to start talking about the actual session and what you'll need to do to prepare for it. If you're an eager therapist, I believe you'll enjoy this section. As an RBT, you're required to run programs, also known as skill acquisition plans. A skill acquisition plan is a written document that outlines the target behavior, objective of the program, and the teaching procedure specific to that learner. This is an important document for the learner because it outlines specifically how they will be taught a skill. Each learner or client should have an acquisition plan that is specific to them. This is an essential part of teaching. This document will allow you and your team to run the program as designed by your supervisor. Without these documents, we cannot guarantee that you'll run the program consistently and therefore that may impact your learner's progress. Your supervisor will design a program that is conceptually systematic. If you recall back to Bear, Wolf and Risley's article, this means it uses the principles and procedures of applied behavior analysis. Procedures or methods that have been shown to be effective for targeting such behaviors and the skill acquisition plan must be technological so that others reading this document can implement it. There should be a process in reviewing these documents. A supervisor will design the program, review it with the RBT and team, model it, role play it, then put it into action and ensure proper implementation and provide feedback. This is known as a behavioral skills training process. Although your supervisor will be doing these steps, it's important that you read the plan in its entirety. As an RBT, you are required to take time to read the plan. You may need to review it a few times because these plans can be long and you want to ensure that you're running it accurately. You also want to ensure that you and your team are running it the same way. I recommend that you spend time with your team to watch each other from time to time so that you're not running it incorrectly and confusing your learner. Although there is no standard form for a skill acquisition plan, most programs should have these essential parts. This is an example of a skill acquisition plan that we use and the different parts that we'll discuss shortly. The skill acquisition plan will have the learner's name on it. Each child should have their own child-specific program. Your supervisor may have templates of these programs in a standard teaching practice, but many times the teaching may need to be revised slightly to support the learner specifically. Next, you'll have the date of when the program was introduced and the acquisition date. This acquisition date is when the learner mastered the program. The program domain is the area of development we're working on. For example, the program may be a requesting program, also known as manding. It may be an academic program. It's important to know what domain you're working on because that is the skill we are developing. If it says academics, we may be focusing on the learner learning math skills specifically and not working independently. Knowing what you're teaching will help you understand why you are prompting the way that you are and why you're teaching that skill. I'll get into this more in the teaching classes, but keep this in mind. The objective of the program is what we want the learner to do. The purpose of this program. If we were to probe the skill, so test and see if the child was able to do it or not, you should be able to look at the objective and test it. If it says the learner will be able to match one target shape to its identical shape in an array of three, this means that you should lay out three shapes on the table and give the learner one of the target shapes. Next is the SD. SD stands for discriminative stimulus. This is a stimulus that will evoke a response which will access the reinforcer. For example, if I said clap your hands, 
This SD would trigger the response clapping. You clap your hands because in the past I reinforced your behavior. So you do it again because you may access a reinforcer. It's important to vary your SD during teaching. You can say things like clap, clap your hands, show me clapping, and so on. Never use only one phrase when teaching because your learner will depend on that phrase and will not generalize. Another example is if I were teaching match to sample. I want to vary what I'm saying. I want to say match, put star with the same, match this one, put it with the same, match star, and so on. Next is the response criterion. This is the correct response, what the learner is required to do to access the reinforcer. In this case, the learner needs to pick up the shape from the table and place it on top of the other identical shape within three seconds. If the child responds as described within the time given, you would be able to score this as a correct response. If the response was too slow, incorrect, or no response at all, these would be considered a no, and you would score this as an incorrect response. A skill acquisition plan should include the mastery criterion. When is the target considered mastered and when is the program considered mastered? If the learner responds correctly for STAR, how many days or sessions until we say it's mastered? We often use three consecutive days of correct probes. So we take probe data at the beginning of the day. Once they have achieved those three correct responses, the skill would be mastered and additional targets will be added and so on. If a program is percentage-based, such as an academic program, mastery criterion would be 80% or more over three consecutive days. The mastery criterion will guide you in mastering targets away and adding new ones. Without mastery criterion, targets would run for weeks or months. The plan also needs to define when it is considered a completed program. Now, if you're using the ABLES R, this is indicated in the mastery section. It may say 10 skills for level four. Level four is the highest level and the learner needs to gain 10 skills in that program for it to be acquired or mastered. Once the learner has gained those 10 skills, the program would go into maintenance and a new program may be added. Now, sometimes when a program is not progressing, we need to make revisions to it. So this is another important element that needs to be added to the program sheet so that the RBT is aware of when to approach their supervisor or when the supervisor should take action and make revisions. You also want this indicated so that we ensure that we take action in revising a program. The worst thing that could happen is no one changes the teaching procedure or takes appropriate action and allows the learner to continue to make errors and not progress. It's a team effort. If a learner is not progressing as an RBT, you can bring it up to your supervisor. The revision criteria may state that after five consecutive no uh, probes or two weeks of a flat line for percentage data, it may state 60% or lower over five consecutive days in which revisions need to be made. As an RBT, you will mention this to your supervisor or your supervisor will address this at the next supervision. The teaching procedures section will outline how the program targets will be taught in a step-by-step -step format. The prompt procedure, the items in the array, and so on. So it breaks it down for the RBT to follow. The more it is clearly described, the more you are likely to see the accuracy of that teaching. The teaching procedure should also indicate the fading process, so the learner is not prompt dependent. And if an error occurs, what should the RBT do? This is outlined in the error correction procedure. The program should list out what materials are needed, such as specific objects and pictures. This is an important section as well, because when we discuss how to prepare for a session, this section will tell you what you should bring to your therapy session. Being prepared is a crucial part of successful therapy sessions. I also have added a prompt procedure section to my program sheet that describes the prompt in more depth. Are you using hand over hand, graduated guidance, or just a verbal prompt? The program sheet should also outline the data collection method and graphing to be used. Will the RBT use probe data, percentage, how will it be graphed, cumulative, or percentage? Is this program being graphed daily? or weekly, and so on. 
Remember, as an RBT, you will be responsible for collecting the data and graphing it. So the plan should have this clearly described for you. If not, be sure to speak to your supervisor so that they can clearly define those areas for you. Generalization and maintenance are important parts of ensuring that the learner has truly acquired the skill. A skill cannot be mastered if it doesn't meet the generalization criteria. I often indicate at least two therapists, two settings, and four to five exemplars. So if an RBT taught the skill with one exemplar and only at her station, this would not meet generalization criteria, and the therapist would not be able to indicate that this skill is mastered. On the data sheet being used, the therapist will initial if they probed it. So if we saw on the data sheet that Linda probed it all three days and the learner got yeses each day, would the skill be mastered or not? The answer is no, because it doesn't meet the generalization criteria. A well-designed program will take this into account. For example, at our center, I ensure that multiple staff work with the kids and vary the schedule so that different therapists probe the program at different locations in the classroom. In addition to this is having parents run these targets at home as well so that we can see the generalization across settings. Multiple exemplars should also be set up and gathered prior to the session. Okay, let's do a Scrabble word and take a quick stretch break. The word is FE, spelled F-E, which is iron from the periodic table. Again, the word is FE. Okay, let's talk about the acquisition plan and getting ready for the therapy session. The acquisition plan should be reviewed with RBTs. Verbally, and the supervisor should model how to run it properly. RBTs can role play with their supervisor to ensure proper implementation before working and running it with the client. The supervisor will observe the implementation of the plan with the learners and coach the staff along the way to ensure competency. You will be provided with feedback during this time. As the RBT, you will be required to run the program, collect the data, graph the data, and select new program targets and update the program as needed. Now your supervisor may help you in the target selection. And I also recommend that you get them involved in this process. So as the RBT, start off by reviewing the program sheet. Now your supervisor may have discussed it with the team, but take initiative and review it before your session. Practice it with another RBT. When going through it with each other, you may identify problems or need solutions that can be brought up to your supervisor. It will also help ensure that you are running it in the same way. And it's a nice reminder of how to run it since we can forget and skew away from the correct implementation. Next, you wanna take the data. Some programs may require that you take probe data while others take trial by trial. Some may be percentage data only. Here is a probe data sheet example. In this sheet, you would indicate the learner's name, the target down the column, you would circle Y for yes if they got the correct response, or N for no if they answered incorrectly. Again, you may be familiar with a sheet like this. Trial by trial data is examining each trial the therapist conducts. It allows the supervisor to see how many trials were conducted. We use a check mark or X to show whether the learner did it without assistance or with assistance. This is nice because if a therapist is teaching and sees a lot of X's, this is immediate feedback that they are receiving, showing them that the learner is not making progress within their session. Now, as an RBT, you may begin questioning why and address this with your supervisor. You and your supervisor can sit down and discuss possible issues and solutions. Once you've collected your data, these items will be graphed daily or weekly depending on the type of data you're collecting. Be sure to update your programs and graphs as needed. When a target is mastered, update the data sheets. I'll review this in just a few moments. Add new targets. This may be provided by your supervisor or ones that you need to come up with based on suggestions. 
I recommend that you and your supervisor brainstorm some possibilities and always think about teaching your learner functional things that they can make use of in their life. For example, I had a therapist who was teaching a learner to answer where questions. The target she set was, where do you find a roller coaster? He was about six or seven years old. Here in Toronto, Canada, we have something that's called Canada's Wonderland, but he had never been there. He didn't even know what a roller coaster was. So I wasn't fond of the target because teaching him to respond to this question was really giving him useless information that was not functional in his life. So I would have selected questions like, where do you buy Timbits or chicken nuggets since he went to Tim Hortons and McDonald's? These targets relate to his world. I showed you an example of a program sheet and reviewed the parts of it. Since our programs are on the computer in folders specific to each learner, each child has a duotang that is kept with their clipboard and all these program sheets are available for the staff. This makes it easier for a therapist who needs to stop and review and look at the teaching process. It saves them time and is easily accessible. The program sheet should always be in a specific location or central location for any of the therapists to access at any time. If your team uses probe data sheets, it may look something like this. Each program would have its own probe data sheet. You would indicate the targets on the left column as shown here with the arrow. Your targets are the teaching targets that you will be working on. A learner may have three targets, five targets running simultaneously, depending on the learner. The therapist would write the date and their initials in the box over here. This is important because we need to know who ran the target and on what day. Finally, the therapist can circle Y for yes if it was probed correctly, or N for no if it was probed incorrect. After three consecutive days, we would indicate acquired and highlight it in yellow so that it makes it easier for graphing purposes. You can look at all the highlighted items for that week and count the number that were acquired. If you're doing this on a computer using Excel or numbers, it would be the same setup. There are a lot of new data management systems out there as well. This is an option, but you'd have to look into the cost and see if that's feasible for you and your team. The skill tracking form allows you to document all the skills that were introduced and when they were mastered. Each skill is numbered. Each skill is indicated here. The date it was introduced and the date of mastery. We also indicate how many probes it took for that target to get mastered if we're using probe data. If not, this section can be left blank or deleted. Again, it depends on your supervisor's data sheet and so on. Not all will look the same. In the years of my practice, I've changed data sheets consistently and sometimes moved away from probe data altogether. Finally, the graph. If you're taking probe data, you would graph this using a cumulative record. You want to remember your condition labels, lines, and I would suggest always counting the number of mastered skills on the skill tracking form and how many you have on the graph and ensure they match. If the skill tracking form showed six mastered skills, but you only have five on your graph, you'll need to go back and see which one was missed or what went wrong. These are common errors that occur. And by double checking your work, you can ensure more accurate inputting of the data. If you're graphing percentage, it would be the number of correct trials divided by the number of total trials. Okay, let's do another Scrabble word. The word is Raj, spelled R-A-J. Raj means rule of government. Okay, great work everyone. Let's keep on going. Your role as the RBT is to keep your programs and data sheets in a safe place. A child-specific binder or folder on the computer is best. If you're using a binder, use dividers for each domain. Keep your binders neat and tidy because these will be reviewed by your supervisor, parents, or other professionals. Every moment is precious to those who know the value of time. This was a quote I came across one day as I was struggling with therapists that didn't use their time wisely. 
I believe that every moment for anyone really is a learning opportunity. I live my life with open eyes and ears, looking to see what I can learn from this moment in time. Time is constantly moving. When we value time and realize how precious it is, we may begin to use our time more wisely and efficiently. My ongoing goal with therapists and supervisors that I coach is to be aware of time for the sake of our learners. Talking on the job with other staff members or sitting in a daze and daydreaming could happen, but how can we ensure that people stay focused and on task? I'm not just talking about RBTs or supervisors or managers in our field. This is an issue in many businesses and places of work. When we realize that moments are precious and to be ethical, we begin watching what we do and questioning whether or not we're being ethical in our practice. So use your time wisely and make every moment count with your learners. So now you're ready to run a therapy session, but wait a minute. How do you do that? How do you successfully prepare and run a session? What items do you need to start teaching? What will your reinforcers be? How will you use those reinforcers? What schedule of reinforcement is the learner on? And many other questions may come up as you prepare. How do you deal with problem behaviors? What are some emergency protocols that you need to be aware of? And so on. So what do you think you need to succeed as a therapist? Well, you need to be able to manage your time. If you're graphing or updating a program, using your time wisely, staying on task and finishing your work in a timely fashion and being organized is very important. Taking notes during meetings, keeping those notes somewhere where you can go back to them, creating a to-do list for yourself so that you don't forget or fall behind. And lastly, communication. If you don't ask questions, speak to others about concerns or issues, or suppose you're away for a few days, getting an update from your team or supervisor is important. Communication among staff is essential. Changes that may have occurred, things about the client that may or may not be working. Whatever it may be, having these open conversations is crucial. Now the challenge that we all face is time. Sometimes staff are not scheduled at times where they can chat. Home-based programs have major issues with communication sometimes. When I ran home-based therapy, the team would leave sticky notes and a communication log that the staff could read. The issue was reading three days worth of updates took time away from the learner's teaching time. Writing an update also took time away from the learner. So if a learner got a three hour session at home, 20 minutes was taken to read updates and 20 minutes to write updates. Not ideal for the client. I've spoken to therapists that work privately doing home-based therapy and asked them what they currently do to communicate with other therapists that they don't even see at all, but work with the same client. And they mentioned that they do a lot of emailing, but that was challenging as well. Before your learner comes in for the day or you start the session, you want to be ready. Avoid running around and looking for material while you're with the learner. Remember, the material is listed on the program sheet so you can prepare beforehand what items you need. For example, pictures, getting multiple exemplars and organizing them in a way where it's easily accessible to all therapists during the teaching session. To be prepared for your session, Gather needed data collection instruments, uh, such as timers or tally counters. Uh, gather needed data sheets, clipboards, binders. Gather materials such as picture cards or objects for the programs. Prepare the learner's reinforcers and workstation. We use bags for the learner's materials and reinforcers. This is helpful because you can put all the teaching materials specific to, the, to their programs, plus specific reinforcers in that bag. Therapists don't need to run around looking for those items. Of course, these bags need to be maintained, cleaned out from time to time, and so on. You also want to have targets ready for the day. If new targets are needed, add them. If your data sheet is full, get a new one started. We use daily sheets, similar to probe data sheets. Since all our program items are computerized, the only data sheet that is being used is the daily tracking sheet, which has all the programs listed so that needs to be updated with new targets. 
always ensure your data sheets are updated. Freshen up your toys and reinforcers in your workstation, bin, or child's reinforcer bin or box. This way, you're always ready and never feel unprepared when your supervisor comes to observe you. I think the worst thing that could happen is that you're looking for a reinforcer on your shelf or bag and you pull out a broken toy or hard Play-Doh. It's not very impressive, I have to say. And I think it takes a few moments to sort through your items and toss things that need to be tossed or freshen up your station. It really all depends on whether you are doing home-based, center-based, or you're in a school environment. When I did home-based therapy, I had my own toy bag and I would bring that uh, with me. The families called me Mary Poppins. In that bag, I brought a variety of fun little toys and books that many kids that I worked with really liked. When I bought the toys, I always had my kids in mind. I'd buy a Dora book and I was thinking of Maggie, let's say, and a dinosaur thinking about Johnny and so on. Each weekend, I would rotate those toys. Make sure you have multiple exemplars of your targets for generalization purposes. I'll talk more about this and why, but what this really means is having four to five different cars, for example, if you're teaching the learner to label car. We don't want a learner to memorize that a red car is a car, but if they were shown a different car, they don't answer correctly because they only saw the red car, so use different material. You can place the learner's targets in a Ziploc bag or in a bin labeled and ready to be used during teaching. When the target is mastered, remove those items and maintain your material bin. Avoid updating your data sheet while your learner is with you. This should be done before you start with your learner. Diverted attention from your learner may trigger behaviors. Now you have to deal with problem behaviors that are being accidentally reinforced. Your time with the learner is to teach them. Remember, you're an educator who is shaping learners, so every moment is an opportunity to teach them something new. Expose them to new knowledge and really make a difference in their life. I have to say, people working in this field are not doing it for the money or simply because it's a job. Being an instructor therapist is hard work. It takes patience and creativity. So you are here because you want to make a difference. You have seen the reinforcing value of a learner that wasn't speaking before speak or a child that is engaging in problem behaviors use their words and no longer injure themselves. So use your time wisely. Teach and make time for paperwork. If you need more time, speak to your supervisor. I mentioned this just a few moments ago. Know what's in your reinforcer bin or shelf. Know what your learner likes. Create specific bins for each learner at your workstation. Create a specific bin or bag for the learner that all RBTs can use. Keep your reinforcers fresh and rotate them often. When you start your session, you'll need to assess the learner's motivation first. Give the learner brief access to the reinforcers that were assessed during the preference assessment. Suppose Johnny got the highest percentages on cars, trains, and books during the preference assessment. You can pull out those items and give him access to each one for 20 to 30 seconds or place all three on the table for about a minute and see which one he plays with the longest. I like to do this after every three to four trials, reassessing the motivation. Remove all the potential reinforcers. Remember, you can use a bin or use a timer to help your learner give up the reinforcer without having them engage in problem behavior. Of course, if your learner does not tolerate you taking toys away, be sure to speak to your supervisor so that they can embed a program for that. So now that you have taken the reinforcer away, run your teaching trial and then of course, reinforce the learner. Reinforce the learner with the item they were last playing with. That's where the motivation was. Now remember, many therapists, teachers, or parents will be happy with the child's response and verbally praise them first, giving them high fives and so on. Be aware of this since it's delaying the reinforcer. You don't want to accidentally give them the item when they're engaging in a different behavior. You want the reinforcer to follow immediately and to be contingent on the behavior. So when the child engages in the correct behavior, Give them the item immediately and say, great work or good job. 
you always want to pair verbal praise because eventually we want to fade our toys and edibles to just verbal praise or maybe stickers and things like that. We've covered a lot of ground. Let's jump into the quiz and finish up today's class. Good luck. This document outlines the teaching steps for a program. What is this document known as? A. Functional Behavior Assessment B. Skill Acquisition Plan C. FBA Plan or D. Preference Plan And the correct response is B. Skill Acquisition Plan Five consecutive no probes or two weeks of a flat line is what part of the skill acquisition plan? A. Objective B. Response C. Mastery criteria D. Revision criteria And the correct response is D. Revision criteria Three consecutive yes probes is what part of the skill acquisition plan? A. Objective B. Response C. Mastery criteria D. Revision criteria And the correct response is C. Mastery criterion Mike will touch the target picture in an array of five. Is what part of the skill acquisition plan? A. Objective B. SD C. Response D. Mastery criteria or E. Revision criteria And the correct response is A, objective. Well done. Layla will touch the target picture with her index finger within three seconds. Is what part of the skill acquisition plan? A, objective. B, S, D. C, response. D, mastery criteria. Or E, revision criteria. And the correct response is C, response. Touch the, find the, where's the, is what part of the skill acquisition plan? A, objective. B, S, D. C, response. D, mastery criteria. Or E, revision criteria. And the correct response is B, S, D. What items will you need to prepare for your matching picture to picture program? A, reinforcers. B, newspaper. C, pictures. Or D, objects to match. And the correct responses are A, reinforcers, and C, pictures. What items will you need to prepare for your matching session? A, clipboard. B, tally counters. C, reinforcers. Or D, all of the above. And the correct response is all of the above. What are some of the ways you can run a successful session? A. Start with a preference assessment. B. Bring your learner to an empty table. C. Place three to four items on the table and allow the learner to select the toy or activity and play with it for 15 to 20 minutes. D. Leave the learner safely at the table and look for teaching material.
And the correct response is A, start with a preference assessment. What are some ways you can run a successful session? A, never start with a preference assessment. B, bring your learner to an empty table. C, place three to four items on the table and allow the learner to select the toy or activity and play with it for 15 to 20 minutes. Or D, bring the top two or three items back to your table. Having toys at your table will be helpful as well. And the correct response is D. After you complete a preference assessment and you know the top reinforcers for your learner, even if the learner goes out into the environment and selects items or toys, you can bring those toys and items back to the table along with you. Having toys set up at the table will always be helpful in bringing your learner back, especially in the beginning. What should you do prior to your session? A. Be sure you arrive on time. B. Be sure all your data sheets are up to date. C. Be sure your graphs are up to date. Or D. All of the above. And the correct response is D. All of the above. You are not sure what your learner likes to play with. What can you do to problem solve this issue? A. Ask your supervisor for help. B. Conduct an FBA. C. Just go with the flow. Or D. Conduct a preference assessment. And the correct response is D. Conduct a preference assessment. Your learner only likes cookies. You have not been able to find any other reinforcers. What should you do? A. Give cookies because that's where the motivation is. B. Conduct an FBA. C. Speak to your supervisor about this. D. As long as the learner is learning, there is nothing to worry about. And the correct response is C. Speak to your supervisor about this. Although the motivation is with the cookie and that's great, we can't ethically just use cookies to reinforce the learner. You're going to have to find some other reinforcers. My final thoughts. The session is the most important part of your day and the learner's day. Working with the learner, teaching them, and making it all flow is crucial. Identifying reinforcers is your first step. Conduct proper preference assessments and use those items contingent on the behavior to see if there's an improvement. If a behavior is not improving, we cannot say that that item being used is a reinforcer, even if we think it's motivating to the learner. So pay close attention to the items you're using and the progress of your client. Be prepared, have the right data sheets, reinforcers, and other items needed to have a successful therapy session. Use your time wisely and use every moment as a learning opportunity. Once you're organized, you're ready to start teaching your learner. Thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next time. All right, everyone, so here's your competency component um, for our skill acquisition uh, plans and planning. This is more about the planning part um, because when you come into your session, um, you really need to know what you need to prepare for. So um, I'm going to give you um, a type of program and what you need to do is look at the um, table and look at the items that I've put in front of you and then you can select which items you think are the right things you need to prepare for at the beginning of your day um, before you get started. So um, let's get started. 
So the first, um, the first scenario is uh, the display that you see in front of you right now. And the program that you're going to be running, you know, let's suppose this morning, is a visual performance program uh, for doing inset puzzles. Um, so we're going to assume that you know what is in the uh, program sheet, the skill acquisition plan. You've read that over, you know the teaching procedure. Now you need to gather the right elements to get started for your day. So what are some of the things that you could pick up you know, to get started for that program. Okay, so I've given you some time to take a look at what's at, you know what's on the table and to select some of the things. So my I'm going to walk you through this one. I'm going to give you a couple where I'm going to walk you through it and then the rest I won't give you the answer. It'll just be on the quiz possibly. Okay, so for this one, I sure hope that you picked the inset puzzle because that's going to be the main part of our program. So the inset puzzle is uh, one for sure. Now, if you have a program and um, you know you're depending on the program that you're in or the center or the home-based program that you're in, uh, you know usually our stuff is on a clipboard, so you would probably need to pick up a clipboard. It might have your daily sheet, ha might have the the programs on it. Um, you're going to most likely be picking up. A a pencil or a pen um, so that you could use those um, to write with so be prepared there and you'll be surprised how many people do not bring a pen to the table or a pencil or even an eraser you know if you make a mistake so have that with you um, the other thing that you might need is your tally counter um, and this might not be specifically for the program. Again, it depends on if you're collecting um, you know, certain data and you have to uh, use the tally counter. If you're using some kind of a reinforcement system uh, and you're using the clicker, then you know, the clicker might be needed. So that might be something that I would definitely pick up. Um, you might also need a timer. Uh, you might want to time how long it takes them uh, to do the puzzle or that might be a part of what's in the program. Uh, so be sure to pick up a timer. I like to have a tally counter and timer, uh, you know, pencil and pen with me at all times. So those are good to have. So uh, you may not need, you know, the pegs um, for your program. So this is, uh, you know, not, not really needed for this program, for your inset puzzle program. Um, do you need Advil? You might, but uh, not something that I would carry around with me while I'm working uh, with the children. It may not be something very safe to have on you, but definitely if you have a locker or if you have your purse, um, then you can you know, put that there. Um, so that you may not need. Uh, the key, not so much. I'm not sure what that's even for. Um, now, the bingo dabbers and the M&Ms, well, if I'm working with a learner, I want to make sure I have the right reinforcers for them. So I'm going to assume that this little learner likes M&Ms and bingo dabbers. Um, so that's something that you could have picked up as well. If you didn't pick it up, that's okay. Obviously, I haven't given you all the information, but I want you to think about that when you are um, setting up for your day. Did you pick up the right things for your learner? Are you ready to sit in that chair and start working with them? So do you have reinforcers? Um, do you have, you know, writing, um, material and utensils? Uh, do you have um, instruments to collect your data, whether it's tally counters or timers? And of course, the main part of the program. So I hope this exercise was helpful. Let's do another. All right, so here is another one for you. Um, this time the program is a matching program. So what items would you need to prepare 
uh, if you are about to run a matching program with your learner. Take a moment and look at the items. Okay, so again, very similar to the last one we did, um, one of the things you'll need is uh, the matching uh, program material. So you want to make sure you have the right one depending on what the learner is doing. So this is a matching uh, picture to picture, so that's perfect. You got the right one, so you're ready to go. Uh, what else might you need? Well, you might need your clipboard again and some uh, writing uh, instruments. So there, you're, you're good to go. And then, of course, your, uh, your timer and your tally counter. Those are things, again, I would always pick up um, because if you are, again, think outside the box. If, you are, if your program does not require you to use a tally counter or timer, um, you may be actually taking uh, data on uh, problem behavior or some other behavior, such as if you're um, running manding you know, throughout the day, you'll need your tally counter or uh, tally counters, so you might need multiples of those, um, so you'll need those. What else might you need? Well, again, you might need those reinforcers and you want to pick, and again, you know, I'm just using standard um, reinforcers here. Uh, you have to pick reinforcers that are specific to your learner. So, you know, let's assume that these are ones that your learner likes. Um, anything else that you guys see? We don't need the puzzle because that's not, it doesn't apply to the program. Um, what I like is a notebook. I like, um, you know, and if, if you could tell from, you know, from the video obviously here that this is uh, a notebook. Um, these are notebooks that we like to have just for fun uh, at the center, but um, you want a notebook so that you could jot things down and I really recommend that people have uh, this with them at every session because sometimes you can't write it um, you know, on their daily sheet or, or their program, um, but you need to make notes about something that may have happened so that you can go back to your supervisor and talk to them about it. And when we talk about supervision and, and communicating effectively with your supervisor, we'll really talk about these elements because this is really important. So having that notebook is really going to be helpful so you could jot down some things. So for um, a matching program, these are some of the things that you might want to gather to prepare for your session. Okay, so now you're preparing for uh, your day. Um, now typically when we're planning for a day, we're not just planning for one program, you're planning for your learner and they might have several programs. You know, they can have anywhere between six to 15 programs depending on the number of hours per day and the length of their session and so on. So now I want you to prepare for two programs. This time it's a receptive program. It's um, identifying, um, you know, common items uh, and pictures, um, you know, just simple vocabulary. So that's one of the programs. The other program is a manned program. And this is um, simple man training. Uh, the targets are Eminem, Bingo Dabber. The next program, um, so it's two programs. And the second program is a man training program. And this learner has two targets, Eminem and Bingo Dabber. So what are some of the things that you may need to gather to prepare for your session.
All right, so again, uh, the first thing uh, and the most important thing is making sure that you have the program and some writing utensils, so that's, that's good, you got that. Um, because we're doing a receptive program, receptive identification, we're going to need some of the pictures and the targets that the learner is working on. Um, and so, of course, you would have pre-selected some of the targets and you would know what they are and we like to put them in a little Ziploc bag so that we don't lose uh, the items. And, of course, when we get to generalization, um, in maintenance, we talk about uh, using a variety of pictures. So you don't want just one dog, you want multiples. So that's something we'll talk about later. Um, so you've got your pictures for the receptive program. What else would you have needed? Well, I also said that we uh, were working on a man training program and the targets were M&M and Bingo Dabber. So you're going to have to have the M&Ms and you're going to have to have the Bingo Dabbers to ensure that you are targeting um, those uh, mans. And the other thing that you absolutely will need to have is your tally counter. So this time it's not even a, a choice, you know, um, because you have to collect those mans. And of course you would need, we typically like to have uh, two tally counters. So for this you would, um, you would have your tally counter for the man program. Now if you don't have a tally counter, remember we talked about this, it's okay. You can do little ticks on the paper or find other ways to collect those mans. So be sure you have um, a way of collecting those mans. Um, you know, and these, these tally counters are great, but they can break. And if they break mid-session, don't panic. All you have to do is do some ticks on the paper. So those are ways to go around it when you're in the middle of a session. So you're always prepared and you're impressing your supervisor because I know that's important for all RBTs when they're working in the field. So don't panic. That's your backup, okay? Good work. All right, so now this time I'm not gonna give you the answer for the next a uh, few. Um, I want you guys to really think about this. Uh, it may or may not be on your quiz. Um, I like to keep you guys on the edge of your seat. Um, always listening, always paying attention because that is important. Okay, so the next one is a fluency program. It's um, We're working on receptive fluency and um, if you're not really familiar with that is what we're looking for is, you know, I want you to imagine that you're reading the program sheet and it says something like um, the learner must touch five picture cards within 10 seconds, okay? So what items would you need for this fluency receptive program? Go. All right, everyone, uh, here is your last one. Uh, this is you preparing for the day, and you have uh, a few programs that you're going to be running. One is an inset puzzle program. Uh, the other is a man training program, and the targets are Eminem and Bingo Dabber. And you have a reading program that you are also uh, running. And with the reading program, you're required to um, see how long it takes the learner to read three pages and you are also taking data on uh, the correct number of words read correctly. So here are the items in front of you. Please make sure you write down all the ones that you think you would need for your session. Good luck.